All right, welcome back. I just wanted to make a quick sort of follow-up to the follow-up video about this uh, cartoon shader. Um, didn't want you to have to sit through 45 minutes of me rant about uh, kernel convolution if you just want to see how it works and what the parameters are. So here's the quick rundown of, of what it is and what it does. Um, we've got this outline shader, which is applying two different outlines. One is to things that have a very different, very large difference in depth. So this pixel is much different than this pixel in terms of their distance from the camera. And then that wouldn't hit uh, these kind of inside edges because if you think of the inside of these stairs, the, they're about the same distance from the camera. So we are also adding in a component that checks uh, if the two pixels are on surfaces that have very different world normals. And that adds those back in. Um, and then we've got the cell shader. Uh, which just kind of has a threshold, and if um, pixels are more shaded, um, then they get the dark tint, and if they are less shaded than that threshold, they get this light tint, which is currently set to nothing. Pretty simple stuff. Um, here's what it looks like. Uh, another quick note about the cell shader, I mentioned this in the video, but um, it'll tend to ruin specularity, metallic roughness, translucency, and emissive effects. Um, not necessarily ruin. This mannequin has a lot of specular information and it doesn't look too bad. It, it kind of clashes with the effect, but um, sometimes it'll misinterpret specular or metallic information as lighting information. And so we've also got the ability to turn it off on any object that you want or to tweak parameters locally, which is the great thing about this. Um, I want to show you really quick a kind of advantage that this one has over the old one. And this post-process volume is my new one. I'm going to disable that. And then the old one I found is over here. And, uh, you know, it's not bad. It still works. A totally valid way to do this. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it's got a couple issues, mostly that it's not very very tweakable, not very parameterized. If you want to edit the, the, the tints of the shadows, you'd have to edit this texture, and that's no fun. And then it's also got this problem where if you go very far away from the landscape, you start to get this really weird effect. Um, and this is true of any kind of organic mesh. It's just a very noisy filter that's being applied. And I haven't provided the tools to adjust it as much as I'd like. So let me go back to the other one and show you what adjustments you can make. Let me just re-enable you. Um, I've gone ahead and cleaned everything up. Put it all in nice comment bubbles and all that jazz. That's going to be one of the instances. So uh, let's take a look at the cell shader first because it's pretty easy. Look at the instance here. You've got a tint for the shaded areas and a tint for the non-shaded areas. That's pretty uh, pretty self-explanatory. You can get some really cool effects by combining these and kind of mimicking some light. That's pretty cool. Um, so you can, you can really tweak things. And uh, you'll notice that a lot of the specularity and other um, information about things like the color of the light get in. If you want to handle all of that and do a straight cell shader, and this is covered in the forum post, what you'd want to do is set these blend amounts for the dark and the light to zero. And that's going to not add in any information about light color or any of the other post-processing, um, just materials and our cell shaded lighting information. So if even if you have specular information, if it isn't being interpreted by the cell shader, it just will not be processed. And that's a look you can go for, the kind of straight 2D look. Um, I find it ends up a little bit noisy, and I kind of do want some of that lighting information. It just works a little better in my mind for something you're actually controlling. So I'm going to leave these at 1. You can tweak them to anywhere from full to none. The other uh, last parameter is just the threshold at which it starts to shade things. Um, a high threshold is going to add shadow more easily, and a low threshold is going to add fewer shadows. Pretty simple, but the point here is that you can have multiple post-process volumes that have different instances of this. And so a common problem I've run into trying to do this cell shader is it works fine in one environment, outdoors or in a forest, um, and then you go into an indoor environment that's supposed to be lower lighting and it doesn't work as well. And so this, you can have localized settings, you can change colors and, and tints on the fly, works very nicely. <clears throat> uh, Sobel operator, the edge detector. 
Um, I've split it into three. And when I left off the last video, I didn't have this landscape component, but I'll explain that in, explain that in a bit. Uh, we've got line color, which is pretty self-explanatory. It controls what color the lines are. And I'm actually going to go ahead and zero these back out just to reset things. Um, yep, changes the line color. Pretty easy. Um, we have the two kinds of lines, depth and normal lines. And those have a thickness. This is in pixels, so one and a half pixels doesn't work. It's, it's truncated. Um, I've given you like one, two, three, and four, but if, if I up this value, you'll notice that it ups the thickness of the depth lines. Same with the normal lines. These are the same parameters, just on the depth and the normal lines. I'll leave them at one for now. Uh, the multiplier, you notice that uh, you get some some harder lines and some softer lines. Uh, this is going to determine the kind of range that that gets. So if you just want all lines to be full black, then you can crank this multiplier. Otherwise, you can crank it down. Um, I find somewhere around maybe 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.3 works. I'm just going to leave it zeroed out at the moment. And then the bias is how much of that, how much, um, how prominent an edge needs to be before it's picked up by the shader. So if you want more edges, you can lower this. This will be really apparent on the normal lines. If I lower this way down, even this on the character, you get all kinds of weirdness. If you build, pull it to zero, it's going to do strange, strange things. So don't bother with that. But um, you can you do this to really tweak stuff. If you add too many, you notice that on the uh, the walls and things, it puts lines where it's not supposed to. So uh, you'll want to put that in a. You want to tweak it to your situation, and the same with these depth lines. The final thing is that I've added a couple th uh, a couple properties to prevent. You notice this landscape mesh doesn't have the same problems that uh, the old um, line filter had, where it has issues zooming out. The only problem is the cell shader, which applies effects based on like the level of detail of the mesh, but. At the speeds and the range of a normal game, this won't normally this won't really be a problem. And the way I've done this is by updating every object has the ability to have this custom depth pass enabled. And when you have that enabled, you can give it a stencil value, which is just information you can you can read in the material. Um, a side note is that in order to read this stencil value specifically, you're going to have to go into rendering all the way down at post-processing, and then you're going to have to change this from enabled to enabled with stencil. Otherwise, this just won't do anything. But in my um, Sobel, I've, um, I've got the same thing as before, but um, instead of just having this enabled and disabled, this is what it looks like without this tweak, by the way. It has the same problems when you move around as, as the old effect. Basically, what I wanted is that when I had a landscape mesh, or a, a large background mesh, or anything that has this this problem of being far off and, and being susceptible to this noise, um, I wanted a kind of third channel that that just gets its edges, just the normal based lines. Uh, the problem is that these are providing depth based information where it shouldn't be, and so I basically provided this switch, another if statement, saying that if this custom depth stencil value is set to 2 exactly, then we're going to use just the normals, in fact a third set of landscape normals, with its own custom set of parameters, so that you can tweak that. Um, and this means, effectively, that we've got some really cool stuff. So I can take this and if I set it to 0, we'll get everything. Um, if I set it to 1, we'll get everything in this case. If I set it to 2, we'll get just the normals. I think 3, we'll get nothing but it will leave the cell shader, and then 4 will get nothing at all. And that means it's very customizable. You can have just the effects that you want to have. And I think this works a lot better. The combination of um, normal and depth lines on everything except far off landscape meshes means your character looks fine. He doesn't get lines put in where they're not supposed to be, but you can get just this outline information uh, to make up for the lack of shadow information in the, in the, um, in the landscape which is pretty good. So the point is that uh, the new stuff is, I think, a little simpler, a little less expensive computationally, and most importantly, it's super customizable, not just globally, but uh, per material instance and, and over time. Um, and so you can really tweak it just to get the effect, just to get the effect that you want. So 
Uh, that's it for now. Uh, feel free to check back in later. I think we're going to be doing some stuff with um, skeletal animation and, and experimenting with some fun stuff there. So uh, thank you for taking the time to check this out.